Hey, what's up guys? In today's video, we are gonna go over all things supplements. I'm going to talk about the supplements I recommend to almost all of my patients, the ones which I think everyone should be on, and the ones I think are complete total marketing BS. So let's get started. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Dr. Kevin Joseph. I'm an internal medicine physician in upstate New York. I've lost over 140 pounds while using GLP-1 agonist and peptide therapy. And since then, I've been slowly transitioning my practice to one focused on cellular medicine and longevity. My goal is to create a platform where I can educate more people on the pros and cons of GLP-1 agonists and try and promote more widespread use of these compounds because I truly believe this is the future of medicine. Over the past few months to a year, GLP-1 agonists have quickly risen in popularity. Whether it's their benefits on chronic illness or weight loss, people are finally using this as a tool to take their health into their own hands. However, just like with anything that rises in popularity quickly, companies and corporations are always trying to take advantage of this and make a quick buck. And that's the unfortunate part, right? You start out as a patient and you eventually become a consumer. And that's why I wanted to make this video because I keep seeing so many ads from companies that are trying to sell a certain supplement. And I want to let you know that 99% of it is BS. So let me tell you the only three supplements that I think that you need, and you don't need to waste your money on anything else. The most important and crucial supplement that I think most people should be using is electrolytes. Electrolytes include molecules such as sodium, potassium, and magnesium, and these play an important role in muscle contraction as well as muscle relaxation. However, most importantly, they play a crucial role in the electrical conduction of the heart. Based on my clinical experience, the average person is always almost deficient in one electrolyte or another. And you know, the average person just does not consume nearly enough electrolytes. And that becomes even harder when you're on a GLP-1 agonist and you have decreased food intake. You may also have some nausea, which actually causes you to lose electrolytes. Another thing is that GLP-1 agonists can also have a diuretic effect on the body. GLP-1 receptors are located on the kidney. At the level of the kidney, they have a diuretic effect. And I think when I use the word diuretic, people always think water, but water just doesn't freely leave the body. Water goes where electrolytes go. So I'm saying that it causes the loss of electrolytes. And when you're losing those electrolytes, you're also losing water. And that can be very consequential in the long run. So because of this diuretic effect that GLP-1 agonists have at the level of the kidney, you might notice that while you're on a GLP-1 that you're peeing a lot more. And that's completely normal. We also recommend you being on a structured exercise routine while on a GLP-1 agonist to you know, prevent muscle loss and to try and retain as much lean muscle as possible. And this often leads to excess sweating and with excess sweating, you're losing electrolytes as well. So by these processes, the overall net effect is that you're likely gonna be depleted in either sodium, potassium, or magnesium, or all three of them. In order to show how important electrolytes are in the human body, I'm actually gonna go over two cases that I specifically saw um, almost back to back actually, very similar demographics, but it kind of just highlights the consequences of low levels of potassium, sodium, and magnesium. So I recently saw two patients in the hospital. They were both early 40s females, but the key is that they were recently increased to the max dose of semaglutide, which is 2.4 milligrams. After increasing their dose, both women experienced severe nausea and vomiting. And, you know, just like we were talking about losing electrolytes through your urine, vomiting Vomiting is another way that you lose electrolytes, specifically potassium and chloride, but all electrolyte levels can be affected when you're constantly throwing up. So they eventually came to the hospital because they weren't able to keep any solids or liquids down for over a week. It's one thing to not be able to keep any solids down. I think that can be difficult, but manageable. But you know, if you're not able to keep any liquids down and you're losing fluids on top of that through either diarrhea or vomiting, that's a huge red flag. And I highly recommend you go to the emergency department immediately just to rule out any source of dehydration or electrolyte abnormalities like we're about to get to. So both of these women, unable to take in any liquids, and they were profusely vomiting to the point where, you know, the usual anti-emetics or anti-nausea medications we use, I'm sure you've heard of Zofran or Tigan, those medications were barely working. Their labs were pretty significant for low levels of sodium, potassium, and magnesium, and we had to aggressively rehydrate them with IV fluids and IV electrolytes. They actually had what we call 
an AKI, short for acute kidney injury. There's different ways that you can get an AKI, but acute kidney injury can be caused by dehydration, you know, lack of fluid through the kidneys, which kind of almost dries out the kidney. It can cause a disruption in the kidney function, which usually is reversible as long as you get rehydrated as soon as possible. So they were having a jump in their creatinine and they were putting a lot of stress on their kidneys from all of this dehydration. So the scary part was actually what we saw on telemetry. It's like a wireless box that we basically put on patients and it's almost like a wireless EKG that's constantly transmitting to a central monitoring system so we can keep track of a patient's heart rhythm. So it's almost like a continuous EKG, not as specific, so it's not as reliable when there are changes, but it's a simple way for us to kind of, you know, keep track of someone's heart rhythm, especially when they're depleted in electrolytes. So we're monitoring their heart rhythm and remember how I told you that sodium and potassium are important for electrical signaling of the heart? Well, these patients would intermittently um, have episodes of ventricular tachycardia which is basically an abnormal heart rhythm. Ventricular tachycardia, or VTAC for short, is not deadly. So there's different types of VTAC. I don't want to belabor the point, but there is non-sustained and sustained. Non-sustained is when it's for less than 30 beats, and most people, when it's non-sustained, it's nothing to worry about. That's actually often caused by electrolyte abnormalities. So these patients were having episodes of non-sustained VTAC. And we worry about this abnormal heart rhythm because it can quickly convert into something called ventricular fibrillation. So ventricular tachycardia is when the ventricles of the heart, it's pumping so fast that the other parts of the heart can't really keep up with it. Ventricular fibrillation is when the electrical signaling of the heart is so messed up that it's beating so irregular um, that it's just causing so much issue and you're not getting enough blood flow out of the heart. So that can be deadly. And that's always our biggest concern when patients are in VTAC or have episodes of VTAC. So we kind of knew what the underlying mechanism was. We you know, suspected it to be the low levels of sodium and potassium. So we were a aggressively repleting that. And both patients were actually also experiencing occasional muscle cramping and stiffness, which is often due to low magnesium. And that also actually resolved once we repleted the magnesium levels. So basically, you know, the irregular heart rhythm went away and actually stopped occurring over 24 hours prior to when I discharged them. Once their sodium and potassium levels were back to normal, the muscle cramping stopped once their magnesium levels were back to normal. And, you know, their kidney function almost returned completely back to baseline and to normal once they were rehydrated hydrated but it can be scary. It can be really scary. But you know, it just goes to show how important electrolytes are or the loss of electrolytes is. So that's why I always highly recommend, you know, the number one supplement I think people should be taking is electrolytes. I don't have a specific one that I recommend. You can go on Amazon, find one that's either the cheapest or the best tasting based on reviews. Ultimately, they're kind of very similar. You can also make your own electrolyte mix. You can use just regular salt as well as um, something called no salt as well, which is basically just crystallized potassium, which you can get at the supermarket. It's very popular in the keto community. So if you go online and you look up keto light, they'll show you how to make your own electrolyte mix. So, you know, just make sure you stay on top of taking in your electrolytes, consuming them daily, especially if you're exercising regularly, working out hard and you're sweating profusely. Please, please make sure you're repleting your electrolytes. Get your lab work done so that you know what your sodium levels are, your potassium levels are, because levels that are too low can be deadly, like we were just talking about. Thankfully, these patients were young. We call it in time, but it could have had pretty significant consequences. The only time I don't recommend electrolytes or at least, you know, speaking to your healthcare provider before you start using electrolytes is if you have any sort of underlying kidney disease. So if you have a history of kidney disease, please speak to your nephrologist or your primary care doctor before starting um, electrolytes because the electrolytes are filtered through the kidney. So the kidney, you know, filters out electrolytes and it also brings electrolytes in, like reabsorbs it. But, you know, if you have kidney issues, you won't be able to actually filter out some of the electrolytes and it can cause high levels of sodium or high levels of potassium, both of which are also very dangerous. So, you know, please be cautious. Um, I do recommend always doing your blood work and, you know, staying on top of your lab as much as possible. But ultimately, the number one supplement, and I think it's a generally safe supplement, is electrolytes. The second supplement I think most people should be on is some sort of protein supplement, whether it's protein powder or protein shakes. I think one of the things that really irks me because it's just such misinformation is that GLP-1s cause muscle loss. No. They don't. And if you've seen any of my videos, you know that that is such BS. I even talked about the studies of where patients had um, bariatric surgery. And after bariatric surgery or gastric sleeve surgery, there was also eventual muscle loss because muscle loss is not due to a calorie deficit. It's due to inactivity 
and a calorie deficit, which leads to muscle loss. The body can't differentiate between muscle and fat. When you are obese and you have a higher ratio of muscle to fat, it's just easier, right? It's like if there's more fat to use, the body's going to use fat. But once you eventually start losing body fat, then it's going to be harder for the body to differentiate between fat and muscle, and it can lead to muscle loss. Unless you supplement that and preserve the muscle with heavy resistance training, as well as proper protein intake. You know, when it comes to protein intake, there are various numbers that people throw out there. I personally think you should be aiming for at least one gram of protein per kilogram of body weight. It's just an easy calculation to do. Basically, you take how much you weigh, divided by 2.2, and that's how much protein you should be getting in a day. That's the bare minimum. I think everyone should be hitting at least 100 grams, regardless of body weight, to at least start off with and make things easy for you and then work your way up from there. If you need to speak to a nutritionist or a dietitian, I think those are great resources. Most health insurances cover that, so please take advantage of that. They'll help you kind of gauge how much protein you're taking in throughout the day. GLP-1s do significantly re reduce your appetite, either through silencing food noise or early satiety, um, or just, you know, unfortunately the side effects when you're not and you're vomiting, you don't want to eat anything. So it can be hard to reach your protein goals for the day. So if you feel like you're not taking in enough protein, please make sure you have protein supplements on hand just to make sure that you're reaching your goal. Once again, I don't have anything that I recommend. I know that the Fairlife protein shakes are pretty popular nowadays. They taste really good. That's the one that I use. They don't sponsor this video. I have no affiliation with them. It's just they're available at Sam's Club and I'm cheap and I just shop in bulk when I can. Because even for me, it's hard to hit my protein goal sometimes. GLP-1s have finally silenced this food noise. So I'm not constantly thinking about food and I'm so busy working and seeing patients that before I even realize it, it's two o'clock, four o'clock and I've barely eaten anything since breakfast. And you know, maybe that's like 300 calories. So make sure you're monitoring your protein intake. I think it's better to get your protein from whole sources such as red meat, chicken. But if you can't, I, I think there's nothing wrong with a protein supplement. Last but not least, and I think this is more of like an honorary mention, if anything, I would recommend keeping some sort of laxative in stock. I don't know if this is TMI, but I think if you're on a GLP-1, you either face severe constipation or severe diarrhea and nausea and vomiting. I unfortunately fell into the category of severe constipation and it was horrible. It got to the point where I was just struggling for days and I felt it like building up and I just felt this like abdominal tightness and distension. It was just bad. So, you know, I highly recommend, you know, taking some sort of fiber supplement daily. So, you know, when it comes to helping move along your bowels, I think there's a stepwise approach to it that I highly recommend. Um, initially, I think taking some sort of fiber supplement, such as uh, Benefiber or the fiber gummies, that's what I would start with. You know, take them early, take them consistently, and that should kind of help. Uh, make sure you're getting in enough water. Make sure you're staying active because, you know, water and physical activity really help stimulate the bowels. So I would try with that first um, because those are gentle approaches and, you know, it's gentle on your actual body. But if that's not working, I would add in like a bowel stimulant such as Miralax or Senna. They kind of help facilitate, you know, your bowels moving. Um, so I, I recommend those. Please, 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 please do not get colase. Colase is a stool softener. I even hate when people use colase in the hospital when patients are constipated because colase is just a stool softener. That's great. Your stool is soft, but it's still stuck so early in your large intestine that you're not going to be able to pass it. So what's the point of having a soft stool if it's nowhere near ready to get out? If you are using all of that and you still can't go, you could try something like magnesium citrate or castor oil. Those are kind of tough on the GI tract. It'll definitely get things moving. However, it can kind of overshoot things and they may even cause diarrhea for a little while. So I would use those as like a, a last resort if you really needed to. Like I said, start with a stepwise approach. Increase your fiber, walking, water intake. Just uh, try to gently get things moving. I personally use uh, a magnesium supplement. You can also do that. Uh, it's called Mag07. Once again, no affiliation. I get it off of Amazon. I take two to three capsules almost every morning and that usually you know does the trick but that's another option to look into so just to wrap up you do not need to spend a lot of money on supplements to be successful while on a GLP-1 agonist. Because you're probably searching tons of different GLP-1 related topics, you will get ads for GLP-1 protein, which is BS. GLP-1 probiotics, even more BS. 
I promise you that you do not need 99% of the stuff that's being marketed towards you. Just stick with what we talked about, which is one, a good electrolyte mix. Um, you can find one on Amazon for cheap, or you can make one yourself for even cheaper. Just search keto light recipes, a good protein powder or protein shake, just whatever's cheapest. Honestly, as long as it has 20 to 30 grams of protein per serving, whatever will make sure you eat it or drink it. And a laxative if you need one. That's really the only three things that you need. I mean, one and two are definitely the most important. So please, just please save your money. You know, it's not worth it. Don't fall for the gimmicks. There will always be companies and even people that are healthcare providers or gurus or whatever trying to prey on you. Don't waste your money. The work that you're putting in every day, the lifestyle changes you're making every day is all that you need. And the supplements are just that. They just help, you know, accelerate your process or help, you know, support the work that you're already putting in. If you have any questions, you know, please comment below, leave a like. Um, you know, I try to get back to all of the comments. I've been so busy at work. Um, I've been pulling so many extra shifts. So unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to, um, you know, respond to you guys. But I will try my best to hopefully by the end of today, get, get, get back to a lot of the comments. But please, if you have any questions, leave a comment and I will get back to it. I'll see you later.